So I just want to uh, review some of the uh, background principles at RGA. We'll talk about API 545, which is the API standard which supports using the RGA and so forth and so on. Uh, some, of these, uh, some of these slides will uh, dovetail with some other statistics uh, from earlier presentations, but this is our standard RGA presentation. Basically, uh, storage tank fires are more common than people think. There's 15 to 20 tank fires per year around the world, and one third of those are attributed to lightning. Okay, so this is not an unusual event. This happens somewhat regularly. You can see here it, that in North America, 16 out of 20 accidents involving storage tanks were a result of lightning. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in lightning related losses. Of all the causes of tank fires, you can see that of the causes that are known, lightning is the largest share at 31 percent. Here's a short list of some uh, recent tank fires. So may maybe some of you know, maybe some of you know about these fires if they happen in your territory, uh, but basically you know you could tell that there are several tank fires every year, right? 2007, 8, 9, uh, all the way up. Some of these have resulted in substantial LEC business. So we have RGAs here and here and a couple other sites. And this list goes on and on and on. Uh, keep in mind that, that that statistic, that statistic of 15 to 20 tank fires is based on what's reported in the media. So it's very likely that there are tank fires occurring that don't get reported to the media, which means that this 15 to 20 number is probably on the low side. Here's some examples of lightning related losses. Uh, let's just use the second one, uh, number, number two, 2008 Magellan, Kansas. We had a loss of about $10 million as of three months after the incident. And what that means is uh, after three months, they, the customer estimated they had lost $3 million, but then they were still in the process of cleaning up and rebuilding a tank and so forth. So if you think about a tank fire, you will typically uh, lose the tank. You know, so you've got to rebuild the tank, of course. Uh, maybe there's some other uh, nearby damage. There's also fines from the EPA for uncontrolled emissions. There's the firefighting expenses, um, so forth and so on. We're also finding that uh, globally, the sizes of tanks are increasing. So uh, in our, from our perspective, tanks are getting taller and also larger in diameter. So naturally, if a larger tank catches fire, it's a bigger, an even bigger problem. And so because tanks are getting larger, it becomes even more important to follow proper safety procedures and to have proper firefighting equipment in place. Uh, if you can imagine a refinery, a refinery must devote an enormous amount of resources just preparing for fires in terms of equipment and personnel and training and so forth. Uh, another interesting factoid which kind of helps us is that some NASA researchers are forecasting that we can expect a five to six percent increase in lightning activity for every one degree Celsius change in earth temperature. So as the earth gets warmer, there, as the earth gets warmer, there's going to be increased evaporation, which means more thunderstorms and more lightning, which just breaks my heart. You saw me refer to the Winniewood tank fire. Well, this tank fire was uh, was is very well documented. Uh, this tank fire went on for 72 hours and consumed an enormous amount of resource. So uh, I think you've seen this map before. This is a map of uh, lightning strike density 
As, uh, as you can see in the, in the US, the, the hottest area is the Gulf Coast, so Florida. So from Florida to, say, the Houston area, uh, we have Central Africa is the hottest place in, uh, in the world. And then we also have other local spots, say, Southeast Asia, Northern uh, South America, like Colombia, and so forth. Uh, here's a close-up of the United States. Um, again, the hottest area in the United States is along the Gulf Coast, which coincidentally coincides with the location of lots of refineries in this Port Arthur to, uh, to uh, Louisiana coastline. Uh, we're about in here, you know, unfortunately it's not a terribly active region, but the LEC researchers are working on that problem right now. Uh, Peter talked about uh, Peter talked about this uh, this before. Just this is the phenomena of how lightning forms, the upward streamers, and so forth and so on. So I'm just kind of going to glance over it. I would like to reinforce, however, that the average lightning strike is about 30,000 amps. So it's an incredible amount of current arriving in a very short amount of time. When lightning should lightning connect to a tank, the current flows go something like this. The, the lightning strike current, let's say it hits the rim of the tank. The, some of the current is going to go down the outside of the tank, and some of the current is going to, going to go along the inside of the tank. And remember, this current is spreading out on all conductive surfaces as it flows across the inside of the tank across the wall, across the floating roof, and up the opposite wall. So as you can see here, we've got current flows jumping across the seal that's around the floating roof. So during any lightning strike, it's, it's fair to say, it's accurate to say that there will be current flows across the floating roof seal. Now, what happens if lightning strikes near a tank? So a lot, we, I've seen some customers who use lightning masts or tall poles uh, or other tall structures to try to protect their tanks. So let's look at what happens when uh, lightning strikes a mass near a tank. The current flows down the mass. Some of the current goes this way. Some of the current goes back towards the tank which would then go, since the tank is grounded, would go up the side of the tank and over and spread out across the roof. So again, we've got current flows arcing across the seal between the shell and the roof. So the point is that for both direct and indirect strikes, we have current flows across the seals around the perimeter of the roof. A tank is most at risk when the roof is high, and here's why. So let's suppose lightning strikes the tank, this tank here, and the tank is 80% full. Well, the current is going to spread out over a smaller area around the seal, meaning that the current density is higher here than it would be if the roof was lower. So if the roof is higher, we have greater current densities localized on one part of the seal. And so you would have a greater risk of arcing and a sustained arc and so forth. And in fact, 80% of tank fires occur when the tank is more than half full. And this is a very good sales point too, because you can make the case that, hey, tank fires are more likely to occur when the tank is full, which means you have more product at risk which means your losses will be greater than if the tank were empty. So comparing this slide to the previous slide, you can see how what we're trying to illustrate here is the, the lightning current's kind of spreading out, and so the current density at any one point at the seal is lower than in the previous slide when the current is spread out, is, is more concentrated. So, 
So uh, a lot of questions come up regarding grounding and lightning protection for tanks. So by definition, a tank is well grounded just by itself. They call it, in, it's inherently grounded or it's self grounded or whatever you want to call it. You know, if you think about the surface area of the bottom of the tank, it's, it's huge and it's resting on soil. Even if it's resting on concrete, it's still well grounded by itself. So if you think about you know, some guys say, hey, we need to put a ground rod in next to this tank. Well, if the tank is 100 feet in diameter, you've got this huge disc at the bottom of the tank making connection to the earth. So installing a little ground rod that big in diameter is, will have a negligible impact, okay? So it's not worth the effort to add additional ground rods to a tank for lightning protection. The occurrence of sparking and stuff is not dependent on the grounding resistance. Neither is the presence of a membrane. So if, if uh, let's suppose you have a uh, rubber mat under the tank and lightning hits the tank, you'll get those current flows on the tank that I showed you two slides ago. If you take out the rubber membrane and lightning strikes the tank, you'll get those current flows like I showed you two slides ago, okay? So grounding resistance does not impact how a tank reacts to a lightning strike. So it is not accurate to say, hey, this tank is grounded, so we're safe. Okay, that's not correct. There's three components of a lightning strike, fast, slow, and intermediate. Okay, the fast component takes about 100 microseconds and is literally take, takes less time than it takes to snap your fingers. It's also where the current, that's also where the high current happens. So this is a typical waveform of a lightning strike. We've got this, the fast component, that's where your peak current occurs, and then you, we have a slow component that lasts a long time but has low current. Interestingly enough, according to API, API research, ignition occurs over here, okay? So your, when the strike terminates, it's going to dump a huge amount of current but this is so sh brief that it doesn't last long enough to ignite, um, to ignite any vapors. So if you think about like a, you know, like a, like a cigarette lighter, you know, it has to have, the arc has to last long enough to ignite the vapor, okay? And as it turns out, according to API research, that ignition occurs sometime in here. So, you know, so we've been experiencing, you know, these 15 to 20 tank fires per year for decades. And in 1999, the API decided to get serious about addressing this problem, and they decided to create standard 545. And 545 is uh, lightning protection for petroleum storage tanks. And uh, I've been a member of 545 uh, since 1999. And I'm a member because uh, one day Roy Carpenter came to my office and said, Joe, I have good news. You've been volunteered to join API 545. Um, long story short, we spent 10 years arguing about stuff. And uh, one, of the, one of the neat things that we did was we we're able to secure about a quarter, quarter million dollars of funding to do some directed research and testing in support of 545. Uh, that testing information was released as uh, 545A, and it basically describes how you know there was a research program put in place that evaluated the effects of lightning on on sections of floating roof tank and. They got some PhDs involved to really examine the physics behind how does lightning ignite these tanks. We argued about this uh, material for about 10 years, and in 2009, API 545 was released as an RP, which is a recommended practice. So <coughs> as of right now, it's still a recommended practice, which means that customers do, it's, it's not mandatory, so it's not a code, it's a recommended practice. 
So it's not mandatory that they follow the recommendations, but it's a good idea. Here's a cutaway view of a, of a typical uh, floating roof tank. So here's the top of the floating roof. There's usually some kind of mechanism, like a spring-loaded mechanism to uh, keep the floating roof centered in the tank. So you can imagine this, um, as this roof goes up and down, this piece here slides up and down on the inside of the tank. Um, there are some seals here to control the vapor. Um, the industry freely admits that these seals are not perfect, meaning that everyone acknowledges there is some leakage or evaporation which escapes up through these seals and into the atmosphere. And there's a lots of different designs for this, but this is, this is kind of typical what it looks like. So when lightning hits, a tank, either if it's the shell or the roof, you can get arcing here or here or here or here, anywhere along here, right? The, current, the current's trying to flow from the shell to the roof. And so it's gonna to try to arc from the shell to the roof along any of these points. So from this illustration, it becomes obvious that we need to bond. We need to put an electrical bond in place between the roof and the shell. So there's two ways to bond the roof and the shell. One is called, one way would be to use a shunt, and the other is a bypass conductor. A shunt is simply a piece of metal. We show it here. It's a piece of spring steel that's mounted to the floating roof and presses up against, um, presses up against the inside of the tank. Uh, using shunts, shunts is a kind of an old technology. Shunts have been around for decades, and and they're on they're in place on just about every floating roof tank I've ever seen. Um, typically, they put shunts every 10 feet around the perimeter of the roof. And again, it's just the, it's just a piece of spring steel pressing up against the tank. The problems with shunts, well, there's lots of problems with shunts. They're, they're depending on that tension of the spring to press up against the tank shell. Um, sometimes the inside of the tank has goo on it, like tar or wax or rust or whatever. So you could have a piece of spring steel pressing up against uh, a rusty surface or uh, a surface with tar or it and so forth. And so you have a high resistance bond is what you have. And uh, most importantly, number five, the API put out a statement that said arcing will occur at the shunts during all situations, okay? So for years, historically, when there was a tank fire, the, uh, they would blame the, they would like, here's my read on it. When there was a tank fire, they'd find this low level guy in the refinery and they would blame him for not cleaning the shunts. And, these reports would say fire was caused by poor shunt maintenance. So I talked about this quarter million dollars that we got for testing. One of the things we did was test shunts, different kinds of shunts, and it turns out a brand new shunt on a perfectly clean tank shell will generate arcing during a lightning storm. Okay, So that means it doesn't matter if the shunts are maintained or not, really. A clean shunt or a dirty shunt is going to arc in all cases. We, uh, some, some, uh, some customers paint the insides of their tanks and so you could have the shunt pressing up against a painted surface which is a high resistance. Sometimes or oftentimes tanks are not round, right? So let's suppose you're building a tank that's 250 feet in diameter. Well it's pretty hard to construct something 250 feet in diameter and have it be perfectly round. So when, uh, if the tank goes out of round, and it, you know, it could go out of round over time, right? During the heat, you know, summer heating, winter cooling, hot product, cool product, full, empty, and so forth. If it goes out of round, well, the shunts can pull off the sides of the tank. So again, I need to reiterate, current flows across the, roof shell interface in all situations, okay? 
Doesn't matter if it's a new shunt, dirty shunt, direct strike, nearby strike, strike to the shell, strike to the roof, doesn't matter. And this is the photograph that accompanied that official uh, shunt warning. This is a photograph of a, um, this is done in a lab by the company that was hired by the API. So this is an API photograph. And this is a simulation of a shunt uh, touching a piece of steel that simulates the tank wall during a lightning strike. The other way to connect the roof and the shell is to use a bypass conductor. And a bypass conductor is just a fancy word for a wire, okay? It's a fancy way to say oh, it's a wire that is connected on one end to the top of the shell and the other end's on the roof, hence bypassing the seal or going around the seal. A, uh, an RJ is a type of bypass conductor. A piece of wire is a type of bypass conductor, okay? It's just a fancy name for a piece of wire. Uh, a lot of tanks have an existing bypass conductor. A lot of tanks are, are built by, they'll, they'll hang a piece of wire under the ladder. One end's anchored on top of the shell. The other is uh, attached to the roof at the bottom of the ladder. So, so if you do use a conventional piece of wire, uh, the wire, has to be long enough, obviously, to be in place when the roof is low. So let's suppose you have a tank that's 50 feet high. Well, that wire has to be 50 feet long. So if you fill up the tank, that wire then looks like this. And I found that this, this is a very effective slide that gets the idea of across of why using plain wire is a bad idea. So when the roof is high, a conventional bypass conductor is going to look like this. And you, you can get arcing, if the wire is bare, you can get arcing where it, it lays on itself, like here and here. And of course, bends add inductance to wire. So this wire becomes, has a greater impedance when it's hanging loose like this than it does when it's straight. Here's why I mentioned earlier, a lot, a lot of tank owners just use a single wire hanging under the ladder and call and, uh, as the bypass conductor. So this wire here, they'll attach one end up, up here and the other end goes down here somewhere. So, we, so, so long story short, the, uh, so API 545 is taking the position that the safest combination would be to have both shunts and bypass conductors because you really need to worry about both the fast and the slow components of the lightning strike. So, the shunts, will conduct the fast component and the bypass conductors will conduct the slow component. The, uh, I, you know, in theory, the current transitions from the shunts to the bypass conductors during the intermediate phase. Now, I made the point earlier that, that vapor ignition primarily occurs during the slow component. So, it's imperative that the strike current be conducted from the shunts and through the bypass conductors before the vapors can ignite. And so that's kind of why you need both shunts and bypass conductors, right? Because we're dealing with both the fast and the slow components of lightning strike. If you have just shunts, well then the current will stay in the shunts. And then when you get the, comp the slow component, It'll, you'll have sustained arcing at the shunts, which could cause ignition, obviously. And if you have just bypass conductors, you are not, uh, the, the research says that the fast component does not go through the bypass conductors. So you kind of need both for the, the most amount of safety. So 545 came out with three uh, primary recommendations. 
And uh, two of them are controversial, but we think the one is uh, crystal clear. Uh, the first one is, the first recommendation was to move the shunts to a submerged position. So traditionally, shunts were always installed on top of the roof. And the idea behind number one here is that if the shunts are placed under the roof, then the arcing that occurs at the shunts would occur under the liquid. And since there's no oxygen under the liquid, there would be no ignition. And that idea was actually, uh, Chevron actually owns the patent for submerged shunts. So Chevron, we know Chevron, right? Chevron was fully on board with this idea of submerging the shunts. Now, I'm not saying it's practical, I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying it's cheap, I'm just saying the science supports submerging the shunts. Recommendation number two, insulate all the sealed components and gauge pole and so forth. All we're saying here is, um, if, we, if we look at all the ways that uh, the lightning current can, go, can flow from the shell to the roof, well, we want to put an insulator in there. We want to make it difficult for the current to flow between the roof and the shell through the hangar assembly and through the gauge pole and any other way. We want the objective is to force the current to flow through the shunts during the fast component and through the bypass conductors on the slow component. The recommendation number three was to install bypass conductors no more than every 30 meters or 100 feet around the tank circumference, and furthermore, that the bypass conductor should be as short as possible. Uh, guess who submitted the wording to have the bypass conductors as short as possible? Thank you. Uh, so, if you look at those three recommendations, that third recommendation is obviously to install RGAs right, every 30 meters around the tank. Um, bypass conductor should be as short as possible. Well, the RGA is always as short as possible because it retracts. Um, if you look at the three recommendations, first one, submerge the shunts. You gotta take the tank out of service. You gotta send guys under the roof. It's expensive, it's a pain in the ass. Number two, uh, the seal assembly, again, you got to take the tank out of service, it's expensive, it's new equipment, new technology, it's also difficult. Number three, you can install RGAs on any tank, anytime. Now, the customer might have some local rules about doing it in a service tank and so forth and so on, but we have installed lots of RGAs on operating tanks. It's no big deal. So, uh, like I was saying, the first recommendation, it's expensive. Um, it's expensive, requires a major overhaul. For new tanks, you need a substantial design change. And of course, you can imagine there's, a, uh, there's several tank owners pushing back against this idea because of practicality. And here's an illustration of that concept, right? We're, we're moving that shunt fr from up here to down here. Keep in mind, they're still arcing at the shunt, by the way. It's just that the shunt's submerged. Uh, the second recommendation, again, on new tanks, it's a uh, design change, and on existing tanks, it's a major overhaul. And then thirdly, we talked about the RGA and how having the, R and this is what it would look like on a real tank, every, every 30 meters, around the roof, we have an RGA attached to uh, the top of the tank. So if we examine, uh, just kind of getting in more detail about the types of bypass conductors, I mentioned earlier there's like two general categories, conventional and retractable. Uh, a conventional wire, this is a great illustration, I now have, okay, free. Um, we also have all kinds of accessories for the RGA, so um, you, can, you can get replacement straps, replacement cables, hardware, and so forth. Um, we also have, this, this thing's pretty cool, this is a, a punch. 
It's, it's made to uh, punch holes in the top rim of the tank and also down at the bottom. And, and if you get this punch from us, it's, it is uh, certified to punch holes of the correct diameter in steel up to a half inch thick. Um, it can be operated by uh, two guys. It's kind of like a hand ratchet kind of thing. Um, but this is a, you know, it's a, a great device to help with RJ installation. We've got tons of uh, support materials for the RJ. Uh, we provide copies of 545 and 545A, and you know, it's great to be able to show a customer, hey, you know, read it for yourself, section 4.2.1. It says, bypass the conductor should be as short as possible. That's in 545. RGAs are manufactured for LEC by uh, a, a subcontractor. The subcontractor is ISO certified, so we can provide ISO certification if required. We can provide this ATEC certificate like I talked about. I've had customers, uh, Petro Peru, and Peru uh, wanted to be sure that this RGA was coming from their factory and that we own the patent, so we can provide copies of the patent. We, uh, LEC also received uh, uh, an award for this uh, device. We have copies of that and then we've also translated uh, technical papers and brochures for the RJ in, into English. Well, they were already in English. We translated them into Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. So, uh, in terms of new news for the RGA, uh, I, I'm happy to report that we are introducing a new and improved RGA, and we're expecting to launch that product in January of next year, so three and a half months from now. We're expecting to uh, come out with this new RGA. So as many of you know, we traditionally had two models, the RGA 55 and RGA 75. We are moving to a single model RGA. And the goal of this RGA is to uh, solve all the problems that we had with the old RGAs and to increase the reliability and to increase the cable lifespan. The first improvement is that the unit arrives pretension. So those of you who installed RJs know that it's kind of, the problems we have with RJs are 99% installation related. And what I mean by that is uh, when you, you mount the RJ to the tank, then you have to pre-tension it. So you got to hold the cable and, and put tension on the cable and so forth. So if it'd be easy for an installer to improperly pre-tension it, or it'd be easy for the installer to uh, take a shortcut because it's almost lunchtime or whatever. So the new and improved RJ is going to arrive pre-tensioned. So Customer just, you punch the holes, mount it to the tank of the wall, and pull out the strap and attach the strap. Second, we've got even stronger springs in the new model. Uh, the stronger springs result in 60 pounds of additional retraction force. That means that the cable is going to be tighter, uh, it's going to twist less, and if it's doing this less, that means more lifespan in the cable. Improvement number three, and I should point out, Kirk has really spearheaded most of these improvements. So, um, Kirk, feel free to hop in if I'm glossing over any of these details. But basically, you know, we've, like I said, we put a lot of resources into trying to improve this product. The third major improvement is better corrosion resistance. So uh, we've transitioned the RJ body to entirely 316 stainless steel. It was historically 304. 316 has better corrosion resistance. Um, we are also, we are also, this is very likely to happen. We're going to, it is very likely that we transition to an aluminum cable. Aluminum has a better H2S corrosion resistance than the tin copper cable that we've been using. So this model here has a tin copper cable. The tin copper holds up pretty good 
unless you have tanks with leaky seals with a high hydrogen sulfide emission, in which case the copper does not hold up so well. So we get, we've gotten very positive results from our field tests using an aluminum cable, and it's looking like it's looking like we're going to transition over to the aluminum cable. The aluminum cable does meet the resistance requirements of API 545. We've also changed the electrical connection, so we net will not have a bolted connection at the axle to reel interface. I know it's hard to tell here, but basically we've improved the electrical uh, the electrical connection within the RGA itself. So in summary, we've got lightning causes one third of all tank fires. The API recommends the installation of bypass conductors on tanks, period. And believe me, I am pushing you know, as much as I can. And there's some other people on 545 committee who want the standard to transition from an RP to a standard. But I want, it hasn't happened yet. But believe me, LEC is trying to get this thing made into a standard. Um, and of course, the uh, n number five here, again, coming out in January, the new RJ will be more reliable due to greater retraction force, better corrosion resistance, and easier installation. Okay? So again, we've got, we've got uh, over 5,900 units in stock, I mean, in the field. This thing's easy to sell, and I really encourage you to, you know, get these on every tank in your territory. All right? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.